Okay, so our next talk is called, uh, is basically about Stork publications. Um, I think as many of you will know, the, the Stork publications, including the preprint server sport archive is really the backbone of, uh, of Stork and, and of what it does. So it'll be really interesting to, to get, um, get more, more background on how it started, where we're at and where the plans are. So to lead this session, we've got uh, Zachary Zenko, our publications chair. We've also also got uh, Matthew Boyce-Gontier and Shord Varen. I apologize, Shord, if I got that totally wrong. <laughs> um, but you know, we, we know who I'm talking about. So without further ado, I will hand it straight over to you. Thanks, guys. OK, thanks, everyone. So today I'm going to be starting us off giving a, a broad overview of Sport Archive, our uh, journals, and our book publishing platform. I'm going to then go and just show you the websites on, our, uh, on my browser towards the end. And then I'm going to turn it over to the current managing editors who will be discussing the journals more specifically some metrics, some progress, some updates, and some uh, of their visions for the future. So again, high level overview, and then more specific details about the journals coming. So I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Um, a lot of it will be familiar to people who follow Stork and are already part of Stork. We're gonna talk about Sport Archive, Communications and Kinesiology, and the Stork book platform. Before I continue, I wanna acknowledge the Sport Archive steering board especially Drs. Andrew Vygotsky and Andreas Kreutzer, the current and previous editorial boards, uh, and the current and previous uh, publications committee, especially Dr. Aaron Caldwell, who um, has really done a lot to improve our publication platforms, um, setting up different servers, setting up different standards for typesetting, and um, the journals and the Spore Archive would not be in the current state they are without him. So uh, what st services do, does Stork offer? Um, our Spore Archive preprint server, uh, diamond open access journals, meaning free to submit and free to access. And this is something uh, we pride ourselves on uh, very highly. And uh, you should submit more to these outlets. We're gonna see how easy it is in just a few moments. So communications and kinesiology is the journal currently, uh, accepts original research, methodological tutorials, opinion pieces, um, critiques, right? Crit critical reviews, case studies, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And reports in sport and exercise uh, was formerly registered reports in kinesiology. It's been rebranded to reports in sport and exercise this is where pre-registered studies and registered reports uh, gets uh, published. Currently, it's sort of a special issue of communications and kinesiology, but when the journals become more robust and get more submissions, this will eventually, the long-term plan is for this to be its own journal. And that is considered to be the gold standard of Stork. So preprints, I think most people on this call are highly aware, but I know that there are um, also many trainees registered. So very quickly, a preprint is typically fully drafted manuscript that has not been peer reviewed yet or accepted for publication. So this is very uh, useful as um, Dr. Tiller was just mentioning. It makes your work more accessible. You do not have to put it behind a paywall. It's citable, it's searchable, you get credit for your work. And before submitting to a journal, you can get feedback from many colleagues, right? You post your link on Twitter or ResearchGate and people can comment on it and you can then improve your um, manuscript further for publication. So rather than have two to four reviewers, you might have 12 uh, people giving some level of commentary on it. So authors typically maintain copyright of the non-typeset version, this means before formatting. So think about writing your manuscript in Microsoft Word before it looks like it's a, in a special journal format. You typically have copyright on that version. Most journals do not have any issue with preprints at all. Some do. I avoid these. You don't have to. 
Uh, some are very highly reputable, so I understand that people publish in them, um, but it is a bit upsetting uh, that if you have a preprint, they still charge you the open access fee. Um, the article processing charge, which might be you know, three to $4,000 or, or even a bit more. Uh, authors can typically post post prints as well, which is what I have more personal experience with. Um, so this is the peer reviewed version, but the non types of version. And again, it allows your work to be open access um, and it's not in violation of any journal policy. If you're not sure, you can ask the editor and they'll be happy to respond, I'm sure, to tell you if it is or is not violating the journal's policies. Elsevier journals, to my knowledge, all of them actually allow preprints. So Elsevier gets a lot of criticism, um, based on how much they earn and all this stuff, um, but they seem to be quite supportive of preprints. So credit to them, right? And that's a major publisher. So when in doubt, you can ask the editor or you can go to Sherpa Romeo and you can search for your journal's policies that you're interested in. Not all of the journals are listed. So again, the editor sending them a quick email will ask. You don't wanna be in violation of any policies, but most, are going to be surprisingly supportive of you. So Sport Archive is the preprint server of Stork, um, has I believe over 500 submissions at this point, which is quite incredible. Um, this is actually how I met uh, Dr. John Mills. I remember sending him an email when I found out a Sport Ar about Sport Archive, just asking how to get more um, involved. So this started uh, several years ago and, and credit to him for that. And it was initially on the open science framework, but now it is managed on stork servers. And this makes things a little bit more um, sustainable uh, for the future in terms of cost. So you can go to sportarchive.org, you can search, you can upload. It's very straightforward. There is a submission checklist. But, uh, and uh, the process is made easier with uh, several templates. So you see these templates are downloadable and you can put your work in this template and then upload it so it looks nice and it's a way of doing the typesetting on your own. So here's one example of um, a preprint, replication concerns in sports science, fairly recent preprint. And just want to point out a couple of things about it. Each preprint or postprint on the server gets a digital object identifier. Now, if it's a postprint and it's been published previously in a journal and it has another digital object identifier, then you can link these and Google Scholar will aggregate and all of your citations to either the preprint, the postprint, or the journal version will get combined. But this is very important uh, for citation purposes. Uh, Dr. Tiller was just mentioning how important these metrics are to many people's careers. And uh, again, it helps with searchability. There is version control as well. So you can make updates and make improvements based on feedback. And you can um, always seek improvement. Okay, So that's for archive. Again, we're going to look at that in the browser in a moment. I think most of us are also familiar with the registered reports. Um, stage one review, introduction and methods. If it gets accepted, then you have stage one acceptance or in principle acceptance. Then you go and collect the data. Then you analyze the data, hopefully according to the initial protocol that was peer reviewed and accepted initially. If you deviate from that protocol, you report the deviations from the protocol that happens. It's probably un highly unusual if you have zero deviations from the protocol, right? We generally work with humans and when you're collecting data of any kind, uh, this is very complicated, of course. But you go, you collect your data, you analyze your data, you submit your full manuscript with your introduction, methods, results, your discussion, 
all of your typical components of the completed manuscript. Submit that for stage two review. It gets compared with the initial report, the um, initially proposed methods, and the reviewers evaluate the final product. And it's guaranteed to be accepted if you follow the previously approved protocol, right? So if you um, suddenly find non significant results, the reviewer can't say, well, we're going to reject it based on the null findings, right? It's a way of having peace of mind and um, also not having to deal with the process of shopping around your manuscript for a journal at the end, which can be quite daunting. I'm sure many of us have experienced going to three or four or five or 12 different journals before finding a home. This eliminates that uh, requirement. Although it should be noted that you are not required to submit to the journal that you got in principle acceptance with. You can always submit your final manuscript later to a different journal. That might and probably will be reported in the original journal as a withdrawn manuscript, but again, you're not bound to submit to any particular journal. So communications and kinesiology is the stork journal. Again, the special issue is reports in sport and exercise, which takes into consideration the preprints and the registered reports, excuse me, the pre-registrations and the registered reports. And again, the journal types, original research, methodological tutorials, opinions, reviews, case studies, narrative systematic and scoping reviews, meta-analyses, right? And again, the key highlight is there's no cost to submit, no cost to access. It's all supported by Stork membership. So each manuscript gets its own digital object identifier. It's searchable as well. It hopefully eventually will be indexed in more places. The managing editors will touch more on that later. And importantly, reviewers are instructed to follow several journal policies, which you see here. Right. Reviewers are instructed not to judge the manuscript on the basis of statistical significance, novelty, anticipated impact, or surprise of the results. I'm sure many of us, when we're reviewing, we have for other journals, we have to go through those checklists of, oh, does this make a you know novel impact, or is this um, an unexpected finding, or something like that. And when I do that checkbox, I think, well, who cares, you know? But some journals really do care. Uh, the stork journals don't. So we generally request open data, open analytic methods, some code, um, syntax, output, and research method uh, materials and stimuli uh, whenever possible. In some cases, we, and we were just discussing this in the chat, Data won't be shareable, maybe for some legal reasons or some, for some institutional reasons. If that's the case, then report the reason for why the data aren't shared. But when data are shared, that's always sort of the gold standard. So um, we do sort of request this by default. Uh, if there's pre-registration uh, of the study, then certainly that would be required to be linked to. And supplemental material can be linked in your manuscript and typically it's deposited on another repository. So with the open science framework, maybe Figshare, and this will allow you to upload videos, uh, figures, additional materials outside of your final manuscript. So you see the editorial team here, Dr. Boris Gontier and Bruin, and the section editors. Uh, we have several sections, sports medicine and rehabilitation, physiology and nutrition, exercise and sports psychology, coaching and sport pedagogy, physical activity, health and disease, biomechanics, sensory motor control. So these are the editors who will be reviewing uh, the manuscripts upon submission. And Dr. John Mills is heavily involved with the reports in sport and exercise special issue as well. So you see the special issue on our website, 
sportjournals.org. You can access them there. So reports on sport and exercise has two registered reports, the nature of our literature, and then physical activity in adults with fatigue after cancer treatment, both led by Dr. Toomey. And uh, many people heavily involved with Stork uh, are contributors as well, you see. And if you look at the um, any of the specific articles themselves, you're gonna see a few important components. So the stage one report is linked. So readers, not just the reviewers and the editors, but readers can look at the initially submitted manuscript with the introduction and the methods. And you can also look at the final report, of course. Each manuscript for communications and kinesiology or reports in sport and exercise gets a digital object identifier. The data and code are available here. And you see also there's version control. So there might be multiple updates, um, maybe based on you know, a spelling error, for example, in, in some article. That's not specific to this one, but there might be some legitimate reasons for making some update, probably disclosing that update, but we have that capacity. Okay, and then the newest platform is kinesiologybooks.org. Uh, thank you, Dr. Caldwell, as well, for setting this up, is our completely open book publishing platform. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to try to uh, describe an existing book in that process and try to convince you to submit a proposal. And I know Ymir is uh, working on a uh, book at the moment, and I'm very excited for that, but why not have more? Why not have a whole curriculum for sport and exercise science, movement science and kinesiology or whatever you wanna call it, where students do not have to pay for texts. Wouldn't that be great? So determine your topic, select a team, create your timeline and do the work and publish. Not that different of a process from anywhere else. The difference is it's open and we are supportive of you and um, you're not going to ever feel guilt for charging having your students pay you know, $80 for a textbook. Not that people necessarily always do feel that guilt or maybe necessarily should feel that guilt, but normal traditional publishers have their costs and they recoup those costs through the revenue the books are generated from. We have our costs covered by membership and people who just share these values like everyone on this call. So uh, thank you. So. Stork can be very supportive here. We can help with typesetting, figure and picture acquisition. Sometimes there's licensing involved. We ask that if you do need a license, you, you, get, you do this sparingly. And most of the images hopefully will be royalty free or available with a Creative Commons license. But I'm here to help with that, right? I'm the current publication chair and I've been through this process. I'm here to help it every step of the way. You can also get cover design. I'm not a graphic designer. I went to 99 designs for this particular cover. Store can help with that as well. In the future, there might be an opportunity for some type of revenue generation as well, where the text of the book for students will be free. However, in structure, instructor materials such as maybe lesson plans, maybe some additional videos, et cetera, might be available to faculty for an additional cost. We're still trying to work this out and figure out, well, how can we have this available and then make sure that the contributors are getting paid for this? Um, but that's a, a long-term goal. So let me go through an example very quick. Uh, this is Essentials of Exercise and Sports psychology. And uh, I'm, I'm going to show you this on a browser. But each chapter is individually accessible. Each chapter has its own digital object identifier, which is important, again, for citation purposes. Each chapter is available with the Creative Commons license. So the general workflow, again, not that different from a normal book. Determine your topic, select team, Develop your table of contents. What topic do you want included? 
invite contributors. We started inviting contributors in late 2019 and early 2020. Set a deadline for drafts, review the drafts, set a deadline for revision, review and copy edit, revisions, make a deadline for final revisions, go through the typesetting process. We are improved with our typesetting methods. Uh, previously, this, this current book that you see used Word and basically uh, me and Dr. Layton Jones uh, sitting on our desktops and doing it. Um, but we're gonna use different methods later on to have HTML versions, a PDF, et cetera. Uh, get final approval from authors, of course, and finally publish, which was done in June, 2021. Um, so very quickly, special thanks to Dr. Layton Jones, the uh, co-editor. There were more than 70 contributors. And of course, Stork uh, helped, and uh, helped with the publication process. Um, I remember initially bringing this up and uh, I don't know the exact words, but Dr. John Mills basically uh, required me to do this. And he's like, I demand you to do this. Uh, and of course it was in jest, but um, it was really great to have that support. So that's the past, but I want more books. As I mentioned, I want a completely free uh, kinesiology curriculum. So let me show you the browser very quickly and show you how you can get engaged with these platforms as well. So this is Sport Archive, as I mentioned. This is, if you go to sportarchive.org or your main landing page, there's a submission preparation checklist, which I show to help you get started. Here is communications and kinesiology with our previous issue. And you see different articles here. You can go look at each article individually. Then we have reports in sport and exercise, again, the special issue that I mentioned with the articles here. I should also mention that since this is sort of a lightweight web-based platform uh, with no prints, the turnaround time from acceptance to publication can be very, very quickly. And I should also mention that when your article gets accepted, you won't be getting an email that says, please approve your um, copy edited version within 48 hours. I can, I can promise you that. We're generally very good and uh, approachable and uh, make good accommodations. We also have a submission preparation checklist here. You can read more about the cover letter, the manuscript submission process. Um, important also to note that if you like APA format, great. If you like AMA format, that's okay too. You can submit in whatever format you want and the final formatting will get done later on. So submit in your preferred format. Uh, we don't want that process to be onerous specifically for submitting to this journal. I mentioned the article types. There are no publication fees. You can read about the journal values here as well. So that's communications and kinesiology and sport archive. And then you have the book publishing platform, which is kinesiology books. Um, currently we only have one book in our catalog, but we're gonna have more. Um, so here is the essentials of exercise and sports psychology. Again, it was published in June, 2021. June 14th, um, some um, people may want to have some slight revisions. We can actually make revisions here too, um, which is different than just having a totally new uh, edition. And this, this may be done. Um, each chapter is individually accessible. As I mentioned, it gets a digital object identifier. You can also track downloads and now this, this particular book was helped by you know, Twitter um, initially, it got a lot of attention, but I've been tracking the downloads and um, uh, it's fairly consistent. Um, unfortunately, this platform doesn't allow us to see where each downloader is from, but we see the raw number. And of course, some students will download each chapter individually, but in total, it's up to over 25,000 downloads. Again, 
there's a lot of caveats there. Some people will download each chapter and the same person might get 20 downloads, for example. Um, but still, pretty good. We're happy with it. So most importantly for today, I have created a book proposal form. And I want you to think and share with your colleagues who are not on this call, but might be interested in contributing. Um, what books are you interested in, right? You don't have to make a commitment now, but this is really an interest form. Who is your book meant for? Um, are you doing an edited volume with many contributors? Maybe each contributor leading a different chapter, or are you going to sort of write the whole thing yourself or with a couple of other authors? Give a working title, give a brief description, and that's it. And then I'll get back to you, right? You can email me anytime, of course, um, but we'll then engage in this discussion and hopefully make your book go from an idea to a reality. It does take some time. This is not a process for those interested in instant gratification, but it is very rewarding. So um, I have taken enough of your time. I'm going to stop my sharing and turn it over to the managing editors of communications and kinesiology for some more details about the journals. Thank you. Okay, good uh, morning, afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll tell some more about uh, communications in kinesiology, although uh, a lot of what I wanted to tell has already been told. So thank you uh, very much, Zach. Um, so communications in kinesiology is a fairly new uh, journal, and I hope you've already heard of it through our presence on Twitter uh, and through the mostly uh, uh, the the Stork communications channels. Um, and I'll I'll tell some more about it uh, right now. Um, okay, uh, so it's uh, CIK is Stork's flagship journal. Uh, oh. I'm presenting in a different way than I'm used to, so I'm sorry. Um, and we have uh, open access, transparency, openness, rigor, and reproduci reproducibility as our core values. So I'm one of the main editors together with uh, Mathieu Boscontier. Uh, my name is pronounced Stuart Brown. Um, and I know you all butcher it, but that's okay. Uh, something like Stuart Brown is fine as well. Um, so these are our core values, open access, uh, transparency, openness, rigor, re reproducibility. And the aim is to publish the most reproducible and methodological re rigorous research. And we think that nov novelty anticipated impacts and surprise of findings are not uh, criteria for publications. So manuscript reporting, no results are more than welcome. And we've already seen it in the chat mentioned by some people in that Indeed, that, that is the case at CIK. CIK. Uh, so we have different sections, uh, sports medicine, rehabilitation. Uh, the editors are uh, listed on the right. Physiology and nutrition, exercises, sports psychology, coaching, a sport, uh, pedagogy, uh, physical activity, health and disease, biomechanics, motor control. And there is the special section, the reports in sports and exercise science. And um, yeah, as I said, myself and Mathieu Boscontier are the managing editors. Um, we accept different article types, so original research, uh, methodological tutorials, opinions, critical reviews, case studies, reviews. Uh, and we have a special issue that's the RISE, the reports in sports and exercise, it's the pre registered and uh, studies and uh, registered reports. Um, even though uh, I just looked it up, the official start was only in uh, 2020. Um, we've already received 17 submissions, out of which seven have been accepted. Six have been declined. Um, four are under review, so there's some people waiting for for our um, uh, for, for the reviewers. Uh, and we have seven published papers, so an acceptance rate of 46 percent. Uh, average days to first decision is 10. And I would like to stress here that uh, Mathieu and me, we've had many discussions about this. We think that time is not um, uh, a measure of quality in and of itself, but that if sufficient time 
passes, it is a degradation of quality because we all want our research to be out there uh, reasonably quickly, right? Uh, and if it takes one or two years for your paper to be reviewed, I think your research cannot like uh, affect the community, like uh, not make an impact in terms of uh, show, show positive results, but also not help other researchers to move on. Uh, so I think that time is a factor that should always be factored in into quality of reviews. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's important, but not the most important thing. Um, so advantages of the journal is uh, publication fees are zero. Yep, fully free. Uh, you retain your copyright. Uh, we have no formatting requirements prior to acceptance. So you just build your Word document or PDF document, whatever you like, uh, and you throw it at us. Uh, acceptance decisions are not based on, a, based on the study's outcomes. Instead, the emphasis is play, placed on full reporting, transparency, uh, disclosure, and data sharing. Um, and you, if you submit to us, you contribute to a society working for science and not for profit. And uh, I just made the joke that I don't, that I don't want my uh, stocks Elsevier going down, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'd rather have Elsevier go down the drain, to be honest. I cannot say that. Um, so indexing, uh, because that's always a thing. Uh, people want to have high um, um, high impact factor journals because that's what people look at. Um, I can happily tell you that uh, CIK is indexed in Crossref and Google Scholar. Uh, and uh, we have a very high top factor uh, which is the transparency and openness promotion factor. And in fact, um, if you look at this list of sports, uh, sports science uh, journals, we have the highest top factor. Um, so that really shows that we're going for uh, what, what we're going for, we're, we're achieving that aim. Um, so of course, we're working hard to see there, whether we can also be included in Web of Science and other services, but these things require time and more submission. Uh, and I think that with the high standards we set, such goals are uh, achievable. But I, more important uh, is that um, the goal is to publish good science, not to be a journal with a high impact factor. I think that if we manage to be a journal that publishes good science and has reasonably reasonable turnover times, um, a high impact factor may follow and maybe not and it would be great if it does but if it doesn't yeah if people acknowledge that if if it's published in uh, communications in kinesiology it's a trustworthy source and it's a good paper um that's more important for me um so for pubmed um uh we have uh, some requirements um, we need an ISSN number, we need 24, uh, 25 peer-reviewed articles, we need a two-year history of uh, quality scholarly publishing in the life sciences, um, we need to meet PMC's scientific quality standard, uh, we need to have a peer review policy, we need to have a conflict of interest statement, and uh, we need to have ethical statements. I think all of these are no problem except for the 25 peer-reviewed articles at the moment. Uh, so that's, uh, of course, why we welcome all of your submissions, and uh, they're, they're more than welcome. Um, so yeah, follow us on Twitter um, to see the latest, the latest communications in kinesiology coming out. Um, and submit your work to us, because yeah, we're, we're looking for uh, publications. Uh, and also, if you have any suggestions to further improve the journal, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, thanks for your attention. I've, ha I've had a rather short talk um, because also, well, some of it was already said by Zach, so um, I could go quicker there than needed, but that leaves more room for, for questions. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen now and, and yeah, welcome any questions.
What is the Twitter handle for communications and kinesiology? I'll put that up again. It's a uh, CIK, CIK underscore store. I'll put that slide up. Beautiful. It's in the chat too. Thank you. Okay. Then there's no need to put the slide up anymore. Emer, you're muted currently. How many times have I done that so far? <laughs> uh, thanks so much. I think that the talks are really lining, lining up a lot um, because we're kind of getting into similar issues and the chats are really starting to take off. Um, Zach, George, Matthew, I don't know if you want to take some of the questions that are in the chats right now. Um, I know, Zach, you've already started to... to I'd be happy to to take any questions. Uh... Let me see. We've got a lot of ongoing conversations. I'm terrible at doing multiple things at the same time. Um... So Dr. Dolan, you were just asking some great questions about register reports and Delphi evaluation. I know that you've seen some chatter about it, but you know, I think a more, a more broad point, the purpose of a register report, and this is all my opinion, of course, right? So your mileage may vary with different editors, but the purpose of a register report is to be transparent and, and do the right thing. So if you are doing some study that might result in changes later, such as developing a questionnaire without the Delphi evaluation, but uh, first you go through item generation, maybe then exploratory factor analysis, then confirmatory factor analysis, there are going to be some changes. I don't think, I would hope that most editors would not fault you for going through this natural process, but being upfront about the fact that you would make some changes and, and what your intentions were and uh, how you're gonna go through this process. So I would encourage you to do the register report um, first and I'm, Again, hopeful that the editors would be understanding of that. I think this was something. I don't know that if anyone disagrees. But... Um, this is something that kind of confused me slightly, and I, I apologize if I'm expressing my ignorance, but it's my first time to consider doing a registered report. I'm trying to wrap my head around some things, and I imagine seeing this are quite new in the field. Maybe many other people haven't done them either. Um, so essentially, I'm kind of thinking about the order of various things, like for example, I assume you go through ethics first. However, sometimes what happens if the editors and your registered report request some changes that impacts some aspect of your study design? Um, and, and this one has an extra layer in terms of we want to send our question out, air out to experts in the area to, to get feedback and of course to, to work on that. But I'm just aware of that the review process is a stage one report, seeking feedback from others, ethics, all may result in changes. And then at what point do you have to inform others? You can't do them one after the other because your planning for your project will take five years. <laughs> um, and it also has the potential to create a loop if, if, if somebody says suggest a change and then you have to, uh, it just confuses me slightly. And I apologize if I'm expressing my ignorance here, but perhaps. <laughs> I, I think that's very clear and, and very common issue. Um, you know, personally, um, you, I, I know that I made a modification to the IRB first, right? But in the future, the next register report, I'm planning on just submitting to the journal and then submitting to the uh, institutional review board afterwards and saying, oh, by the way, these methods have been approved by the journal. So I think you could do it both ways. I'm not sure Dr. Uh, okay. is on the call, but you know, it would be, or, or someone else, but it would be great to hear of someone who has been through this process, including public publishing, um, might chime in. Uh, I hadn't actually thought of it, Zach, going that way to, to do the, submission to the journal first and then the ethics I kind of always thought in the opposite direction. Uh, Rosie has chimed in here that modifications to IRB are typically much quicker than full application. 
I think that depends on, I, I, I agree, but it can very much depend on the institution. Sometimes they get snarled up. Um, and I, I suppose I just think that sometimes there's a risk of going around in, in circles of trying to make everything right, trying to line everything up, trying to be more open. But as Nick pointed out earlier, if we go so much in quality, we end up losing, just nothing ever gets done. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something I'm trying to wrap my own head around the how to keep things moving forward while being as rigorous as possible. I see more chats coming in here. I'm going to suggest though, actually, we were, this session was due to wrap up at um, pretty much now. So there is a lot of conversations and kind of discussion going on in the, the chat. However, luckily enough, our next few talks are very much discussion based and there's going to be breakout rooms and some um, kind of more specific scenarios. So hopefully we'll have a chance to explore these our next sessions led by uh, Chris McCrum and Sam Orange. So I think we will have the opportunity to maybe delve into some of these issues and these conversations that have already started within the chat. So guys, thank you so much. I am going to stop the recording on this one here. We've got a five minute break um, just for people to, to grab a coffee or do whatever you need to do. And let's meet back here in five minutes uh, where Chris McCrum is going to lead a session on uh, easy ways to open science. Thank you.